I want you to look at the person next to you. Look deep into their eyes. <laughs> and say, I am so dysfunctional. Now, how many of you, just, just be honest, how many of you wanted to change that and go, you are so dysfunctional? That's easier, right? Isn't that easier? Because we can, we can see some stuff on some people. We'll, we'll watch some people for a little while. How many of you got that one family member? How many of you don't have that one family member? Hands up. If you don't, it's probably you. Now, we, we, all, we all have some dysfunction in our life and some of the ways we think through things, the way we, we process things. And so that's where we're going to be in this, the second half of this. The first half of the good life was a reminder of who Jesus is, that in the beginning, in creation, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. And he created it all so that he would get the glory, but it was all created for our good. Everything God created was for his glory and our good. Then you and I, as we often do, stepped in the middle of it and messed the whole thing up. And it wasn't even like a real complicated instruction we were given, and we messed it up. It was simple, just not easy. Don't eat that tree. Which tree? That one. The one in the middle? The one in the middle. Don't eat, don't eat from the one in the middle that one, that one. Don't eat that one. How many of you feel like you've had that conversation with your kids? <laughs> right? Don't touch it. Which one? Don't touch that one. Which one? That one. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Why not? It doesn't matter why not. I said, don't touch it. How many of you ever got to the place because I said so? <laughs> I feel like God has that feeling a lot with you and I. And so we messed it up. And because we messed it up, now there was separation and we lost the good life. But God in his grace, God in his goodness sends his son Jesus to step out of the great life of heaven into this broken world. He lives a sinless life, dies a sinner's death, resurrected as the king of kings, the Lord of lords, ascends into heaven so that you and I have the opportunity now to re-embrace the good life. And last week we talked about being thankful for that, showing gratitude for that, that if, if you are in a mind of gratitude, you cannot. God created your brain in such a way that you cannot be anxious and thankful at the same time. It doesn't work. And so we see this. We're actually going to show you a scripture today that shows that. Where Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things giving thanks. And there's a reason because you can't do one and the other. We push anxiety aside and we allow Thanksgiving to fill up hearts. And so, okay, what is today then, Pastor Benz? We got to the end of it. We got the grace of God through the prodigal son and Jesus reconnects us to the good life. We're thankful for the good life. What are we doing for the next four weeks? To the next four weeks, we're going to talk about how a lot of you as believers, and some of you maybe not there yet, but a lot of us as believers we have said yes to Jesus, but yet we still are living in only about 50% of God's blessing for our life and God's plan for our life simply because we are so dysfunctional. I got, I got some stuff. I deal with some codependency issues. I deal with insecurity. I deal with anxiety. I'm not a big fan of conflict. Don't mind it once I'm in the middle of it, but it's kind of that feeling that runs you right up to conflict. It's kind of uncomfortable. Anybody with me? Yeah. Okay. Not everybody. Some people are like, conflict? Bring it on. <laughs> you people are strange. <laughs> all right. But no, we all have our stuff. And so I want to just walk through a couple definitions for you today, this morning. If you're following along in your book, I'm going to do my best. That's all I'm going to promise you. If you don't get all the blanks, Jump on tonight at six o'clock. They will all come up magically on your screen and you can fill them out from there. All right. But I'm going to do my best to make sure that I nail them today. So the first definition is this dysfunction. Dysfunction is simply this an impaired or abnormal functioning, something that's not working the way it ought to work. 
Second definition, I like this. It says an abnormal or unhealthy interpersonal behavior or interaction within a group. Second definition I want to give you is function. Function. Now, the idea of function, function is a math term. Function is the in-between. It's the process that happens in the middle. There is an input, there is a function, and then there is an output. That's how this works. We know this in some of the simplest things in life. If you put pasta in boiling water, it goes in as something, and because of the function of the boiling water, it comes out as something different. The same thing happens in your mind. Your mind is amazing. This brain that God created to put inside you is firing all the time. Even right now, you're intaking so many different things. Subconsciously, you are hearing the the air conditioner, the furnace running right now. And some of you in your mind are going, why is the furnace running? It's six million degrees in here. And some of you are like, geez, it's so cold in this room. And your function is different individually. Some of you are functioning in your mind. You're processing the person sitting next to you going, I can't believe they said I'm so dysfunctional. When you heard it wrong, they said they were so dysfunctional. And and, and yet you're sitting there, you're processing it, you're trying to do something. Plus, at the same time, this brain of yours is taking 800 pictures a second that it is then filing away into your brain somewhere. You say, well, I don't know where to find them all. Welcome to the party. But that doesn't mean it's not happening. And so you have dysfunction, which is a broken thing. You have function, which is the thing, this process. But then I I, want to talk to you through the next word, and it's just simply junction. Dysfunction, function, and junction. Those are the last shun words I'm going to give you today. Junction is the place where two things come together. And I want to tell you where these things come together in my life and your life is in our brains, in our minds. You see Paul write a lot in the New Testament about the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. Have the mind of Christ. Have the mind of Christ. And we see that it's intentional because your mind is the greatest function junction, the place where things and processes come together and become outcomes ever created. Your brain. And sometimes we do it in a really good way and sometimes we do it in a really bad way. Any of you ever taken something the wrong way? It's kind of embarrassing when that happens, right? When you take something the wrong way. Sometimes, any of you ever been scared before in your life? I don't mean like fearful. I mean like frightened by something. Someone comes around the corner and goes, boo, like that, and you jump. How many of you are easily scared? It's good to know. I'm watching. Okay. You're easily scared because what typically happens is there's an input that you don't expect and the process of your mind cannot, cannot respond quick enough. And so your body does weird things. You throw your hands up. You yell. Some of you cuss. Some of you don't need to be scared to do that, but... But for some reason, the output that comes out is reactionary And so there was an input, there was a function that happened in your brain, and then there was an output with it. This happened when you met your spouse or your significant other. You saw them across the room, fellas, you remember? See her over there, and in your brain, you're processing, like, I should talk to her. I need to say something to her. Maybe I'm going to, should I use a line? Maybe I should go with a line. You're you're from Tennessee, because you're the only 10 I see. Something like that, you know? And you're thinking through it, and then you get the plan just about all worked out, fellas. You know what I'm talking about. You got the plan, it's all worked out, and you get up there and you're like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Because you don't, you, you did, your outcome wasn't what was, you know, it came in as something different, and then it got in your head and it came out something different. I mean, my first words to my wife were, if no one else wants to, would you like to go on a date with me? As God is my witness, that's the thing. That's, I, I said that to her on the, I was slow dancing with her and said that to her face. There's no reason except by the grace of God that she said yes. <laughs> but that's how I did it. So now I'm going to tell you honestly, when I was getting it all, when the input came, that's not what I, my brain wasn't trying, but the output was different. What came out was different. I want to talk to you today about this idea of your mindset. 
See, the, 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 I want to I give you these things about your brain. So the brain receives information or experiences from outside. That's input. It processes the information. That's the function. And it creates a response. All of this is ultimately called your mindset. Your mindset. Collections of belief and thoughts that make up the mental attitude, inclination, habit, or disposition that predetermines a person's interpretations and responses to events and circumstances and situations. Events, that's a whole lot of words. Let me kind of clarify this. So your mindset is the reason that you make some of the decisions that you make. That's your mindset. The reason, so you look back, why do I do this? Why do I do that? Why does the house need to be clean? Why don't they care if the house is clean? Why, what, why? And it's all in our mindset. It is all cultivated from the time we enter this world, the things that we see around us, the things that, the reason we don't touch the stove is because we probably touched the stove or we were told very quickly, hot, hot. And so we start a wiring in our brain that says, if I get too close to that, it's hot and I shouldn't touch it. But we do that with a million other things and it creates a mindset in us. Now, I want to also clarify the difference between a mindset and a worldview. Because a mindset, you'll convince yourself that this is just natural. This is just who I am. Pastor Vince, I'm just a little, I'm just a little short-tempered, got short fuse. Why? Because I'm, I'm Irish. No. Well, I'm a redhead. I don't care. And neither does God that you're redheaded, that's no excuse for your response. But what we do is we cultivate our mindset enough and we convince ourselves that I react this way because it's just how I am. We like to call it our personality, but that's a, that's a cop out. We react to things because it's how we've either seen things reacted to or it's the reaction we've built to certain situations in our lives. So this mindset shapes our attitude and our attitude refines or reinforces our mindset. But there's something different. You have a mindset and you have a worldview. So let me give you an example, my worldview. My worldview is that Jesus Christ created everything, all of it, created it all. And he created it all for his glory and for my good. And then that, that was broken down through the sin of man. But because of the grace of Jesus, I have an opportunity to come back to him through the cross, through salvation. I can live for him in this life. And then one day when he returns or when I die, I get to go home to be with him. That is my worldview. Everything I see in the world, I run through that filter. Everything. Everything. When I look at relationships between people, I look at that through the lens of God. That is my worldview. When I look at how I treat my kids, I look at that through the lens of Jesus Christ. When I look at anything, I'm looking at it through that worldview lens. The problem is within that worldview, I also have a mindset. How many of you know some good Christian people that spank their kids? Some of you are like, uh, that's me. How many of you know some good Christian people who refuse to spank their kids? It's a mindset. How many of you have heard people go, I don't know if you can go to heaven if you're a Democrat? <laughs> Hold on. Or, I don't know if you can go to heaven if you're a Republican. Because it just changes over time. We just, the definitions move and stuff. But we begin to say things like that, not because of a biblical worldview, but because of a mindset. There are people I know in my family that are good people. Then if you ask them about Jesus Christ, he's king of kings and lord of lords. But they are so racist in their thought process and thinking that they don't even know how to say anything other than the N-word in discussing another race. But they'll claim Jesus Christ. Why? Because their worldview is okay, but their mindset is broken. It is what has been cultivated in and throughout their life to say this is just what it is. I don't know why people are getting freaked out about it. I don't know why it's such a big issue. Why do we keep talking about it? Well, we keep talking about it because it's a mindset in so many people's life. It doesn't have to be that. Pornography. The reality is most men, I'll just, I'm just talk with the men for a second. Most men see pornography the first time in their life between the ages of 8 and 12. Most likely it's closer to 8. 
In that moment, ladies, let me go ahead and just scar your day for you. Every pornographic image your husband has ever seen is still right there. And we go, I wonder why they have some issues with intimacy. I wonder why they struggle with relationships. I wonder why they struggle with how our relationship is going. Because at eight years old or 12 years old, they saw a magazine stuffed under their cousin's bed and it created a mindset or the start of a mindset that said, this is what intimacy is supposed to look like. And then when it doesn't, they deal with a life of disappointment and confusion until they get in a relationship that then they dump all of that truckload of stuff into and go, if you don't show me intimacy, I don't know you love me. And if I don't know you love me, then I don't know if this is going to work. So I'm not going to treat you like I love you. And the whole thing gets out of whack. Why? Because of input, how we process, and the output. And we wonder why the world is so messed up. It's because we don't deal with our minds. We don't deal with the reality that there is a different worldview out there, that there are people that don't think anything about Jesus Christ when they make decisions. Here's the scary part. There are people who claim to be Christians who think more from their mindset than they do their worldview. And although it's easy to throw the Jesus thing out there, they base all their decisions on their mindset. Well, this is how I was, this is how I was raised. It'll work for you. And I'm just tell you, there's some broken stuff in your background. When my parents were good parents, did you know that both negative and positive things can be processed and a negative output happen? Did you know that? A lot of times we think, oh, it's like, man, if your background's all trashed up and you, got, you were abused or your parents were this or your parents were that, yeah, that absolutely has an effect. But, but... It's not all the time the case. Let me, let me give you this. Your, your mindset, when our mindset is not in alignment with the mind of Christ, dysfunction takes over. Dysfunction. Broken things. Broken approaches, all that. So both positive and negative inputs can yield dysfunctional outputs. Uh, let me give you this. So my father was a drunk. And because my father drank... I now have fear and tension in certain situations. You say, wait, nope, huh? Well, yeah, because I wasn't sure what to do and so I stayed hidden or I stayed really quiet because in the wrong moment there would be an outburst because that's how alcohol affected him. So now, even though they're gone, even though I'm not in that home anymore, there are still times when this, that mindset, that, I, that input it's cultivated itself into this output. It's another one. My parents got divorced when I was younger, so now it's hard for me to trust or to even believe in love. And so what I'll do, instead of actually loving someone completely, I'll make sure they love me first. And then I'll allow myself to maybe get involved. But that's probably why most of my relationships end up in the toilet, because I don't know how to do this. Or you flip it. And you go, because my parents are divorced, I'm going to get deeply involved with anybody and everybody that will show interest whatsoever. And by the end of the second date, I'm telling them I love them, planning out our ch children and where they're going to college. Input, processing, output. But it's not always negative. I mean, again, there are definitely negative ones. I was abused as a child. I was abused as a child, and so what's the output? Something must be wrong with me. Because why else would you abuse something? And so people walk through these negative inputs, process them in a negative way, and a negative output happens. But also there's some positive inputs. So positive inputs, my parents loved me, were very involved in my life. That sounds like a good thing. But depending on how you and I process it, that very good thing can now say, I have an issue with codependence that disables me to make decisions on my own because they've always been involved. So now even in my marriage, there's tension in my marriage. Why? Because every time we start to get in a fight, I say, I'm calling mom. 
And my husband keeps saying, don't call her. Take your bags. Go there. That's where you want to be anyway. So something that was positive, that man, my parents were involved. They cared about me. They wanted to be in my life. Because of how we processed this, it became something different. My parents were influential in the community. Is that a good thing, a bad thing? I don't know that it's either. I think it's just a thing. But depending on how it's processed, now the child believes that anything and everything they do can or will be a disappointment if they don't live up to everyone's expectations. Great example of this. How many of you heard the horror stories about preacher's kids? You guys have heard the jokes. If you grew up in church, you heard all the jokes about how awful the preacher's kids were. Guess what? They're not wrong. For a lot of preacher's kids, I was a preacher's kid. And there were definitely times in my life that I can look back going, you know what? If I do this or if I get caught, then everybody is going to see it and it's going to be an embarrassment to my family. And then there were moments in my life where I went, if I get caught, everyone's going to see this and it's going to be an embarrassment to my family. Same thought, different intention. And it's what everybody believes anyway. So was it wrong that my parents were influential? No, not at all. Is it wrong the way I processed it? Could be. And here's the crazy thing. It doesn't matter. You can have two different kids in the same family and they'll process it differently. How many of you have seen this with a family where there's an alcoholic parent or something along those lines or there's been abuse and you get one kid that goes, I will never ever do that, live like that, make those choices in my life. And they take a hard right and do something completely different. And then another kid that lives in the same exact household goes, oh, that's how you're supposed to do life. So that must be what I need to do. And they walk through the exact same decisions in the second generation. And they're the same kids and everybody's confused going, I don't know what happened. It all happened in the processing. You say, Vince, are we ever going to get to the Bible? Yes. We're going to be in Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bible, you can start turning there. Okay. So when we start thinking, and that's the key thing. We as believers, we have been convinced that this salvation thing that we get from Jesus is all about our feeling. Man, I just felt the Lord today. Had a good service. How do you know? I just felt the spirit move. I felt like this. I just felt like God was leading me. I just felt like the spirit was drawing me. I just felt like, and listen, I don't want to discount the movement of the spirit. But like I said, it's only about 50% of the equation. Because if God moves your heart, but you don't change your mind, you won't ever lead anyone to Christ. And because of some of you not being willing to change your mind, you will constantly, this will be as far as you go in your Christian walk. What you're experiencing right now, that'll be all you get out of it. Well, who are you to say that? And I'm not judging you because I don't know where you are in your walk. But for some of you, myself included in certain seasons of my life, I hadn't changed my mind. I knew God had saved my soul, but I had not allowed God to change my mind. And this prideful thinking, here's this thing, prideful thinking will always be the thing that keeps, saying, keeps us from addressing our dysfunctional mindset. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, it's fine. Hey, is this something? No, it's not an issue. I'm fine. I just got a little upset. I just got a little angry, you know, got short fuse. I'm, I'm a redheaded Irish Italian something or other. And so I got mad. You know, I got pushed around as a kid. So now I don't take crap from anybody. Mindset. 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 And we wonder, Pastor Vince, sometimes it just feels like I don't hear from God. Would you know what it sounded like if you did hear from God? Let me just tell you how real this is. I've been doing this 22 years. 22 years I've been a pastor. I've done some other things on the side, but literally 22 years I've given my life to this. And God has blessed me in this. God has blessed me in every church Jennifer and I have ever been in. We've seen growth, we've seen people saved, we've seen some pretty amazing things happen. And then COVID jacked with me. Some of you are like, COVID jacked with everybody. I know, but maybe for me, and I'm not going to say I'm different from everybody. I've talked to some other pastors who deal with the same thing. So here's the deal, man. Real life church, whew, growing, thriving, doing good. 
I think we were running about 13, 1400 people before COVID hit. We were getting gearing up for the biggest Easter we'd ever had. Because it was in March, you guys remember? And I'm amped about it, man. Woo! People are going to come to Easter. There's going to be thousands of people at Easter. It's going to be good. I'll just confess, you, you, you can't do or you don't do what I do up here without at least a little bit liking the idea that people are going to look at you. Okay? You got to be okay with it a little bit. Like I've seen nervous preachers before and it's uncomfortable. Am I right? It's uncomfortable. I'm not nervous up here. It wouldn't matter if there were 6 million of you in this room. I would be just as comfortable. It wouldn't matter. Never has mattered to me. The problem is when COVID hit and people, I'll walk you through my mind process. So don't feel judged by this. So here's what happened. COVID hit and I was shocked because man, I thought I'd done really good at convincing people to come watch me. And in a matter of two weeks, nobody came to watch me. Nobody did. For 12 Sundays, nobody came. And I would come in here and I would sit and I'd go, maybe I'm not that good. Maybe people don't really give a rip what I have to say. Maybe it doesn't matter and I should go sell insurance or funerals or whatever else I've sold in my life. I'll, I'll go do that because obviously no one cares what I have to say. And it only got worse as time went by because then I'd be walking around town. I'd get into Lowe's and Home Depot and the restaurants and Walmart and I'd see everybody that was coming to church. But then when it came to church, then we were worried about COVID. And I'm like, that just proves what I've been thinking. It has nothing to do with it being COVID. It has everything to do with it. Church is easy to dismiss. And if church is easy to dismiss, that's who I am. That's what I do. I do church. And if church is easy to dismiss, that means I'm easy to dismiss. And God tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hey, can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, sure. No one else wants to right now. They'd rather argue with me about a mask or not a mask. Did you get the shot or did you get in the shot? I'm like, none of that stuff matters to me because they didn't come listen to me. Why are they asking me now? They didn't care then. They don't, I'm not telling anything now. What arm should I get the shot in? Pick a spot. I don't care. I was bitter, a little mad. Sorry if you didn't know this. I'm just confessing to you. God said, can I talk to you? And I said, yeah. And he said, I have a question. I'm like, yeah. He said, were you really disappointed that people stopped coming to see you? Or were you disappointed that people stopped coming to see me? And he and I had a really, really good talk. They really set me free from some things, but I had to peel back some stuff in my own heart and some of my own in, in insecurities and my own anxieties and my own fears where I needed some things in my life, this codependency. Some, I, I need, and, and God was like, you don't need that. You got me. And I'm like, yeah, but God, um, sometimes I don't, I don't get a pat on the back from you like I want. He said, that's because sometimes you don't do what I want you to do. That's a good point. And he really worked on my heart and changed my heart. And somebody came to me this morning after I said this. They said, we can tell a noticeable difference in the message you preach now as opposed to messages you preached two years ago. And I said, it's 100% because of the work that God has done in my heart and let me know that he is enough. He is all I need. Whether there's six of you in here or six million I could really care less. I'm going to preach either way and I'm going to preach my guts out either way. But it took me walking through, peeling back my mindset and going, God, I have to change the way I think so that my heart is right. You say, what? Think in your heart. Yeah, that's the part we miss. Okay. And here we're going to dive into scripture. I told you we were going to get there. Prideful thinking keeps us from addressing our dysfunctional mindset. It happens to me, it happens to you. But catch this, do not, Romans 12, verse two and three, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what, church? Mind. Mind. 
Stop right there. I want to give you some Greek here. The word transformed is where we get our word metamorphosis. It is, now listen, you can get a butterfly and you can get a caterpillar, but a caterpillar is not a butterfly and a butterfly is not a caterpillar until it walks through or goes through this process of change. Metamorphosis, metamorphize, transform. This mind is not supposed to be the same mind after Christ as it was before Christ. That means I have to work on some of my reactions and my responses and the things I want to say that would have been natural for this guy, but now because of Jesus aren't natural. So I've got to let Jesus begin to change my heart and my mind so that I see things clearly. Catch this. This is what I was saying about how I believe we have an American church that is living at half. It says, the renewing, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, that's huge. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Pastor Vince, I just wish I knew God's will for my life. Are you willing to peel back the junk in your mind to find God's will for your life? Are you willing to get down into the dirty stuff, the gritty stuff that hurts your heart? And you, you know, Pastor Vince, what do you mean? I mean, you got stuff. And the stuff you got is stopping you from really experiencing God. Like he wants you. To, no, I don't know. Listen, I have a healthy family, man. I know I've had people go, man, your family's dysfunctional. And maybe, yeah, we are a little bit. But my parents loved me. They took care of me. It wasn't perfect, but my parents loved me, took me to church all the time. It was great. But when I was eight years old, my dad was in a car wreck. I was in the back seat. It was Delta 88. The drunk driver had come around two cars and T-boned my dad right in the driver's side door. My dad was in the hospital for about two months. They finally let me see him about three weeks in. I walked into the hospital room at eight years old. My mom was walking me down the hallway, terrified, walking down the hallway of the hospital, walked in the door of my dad's room. My dad's laying in the bed, nurse sitting over him. And he, she said, good to see you guys. And we were like, hi, and I'm waving hi. I said, hi, dad. My dad pulled the nurse down real close to him. And he said, ma'am, who is that young man at the door? See, got amnesia from the wreck. My father didn't know me. Did he mean it? No. Did he get it back? Yeah, he knows me now. But in that moment, that which I knew was stable, secure, solid, my father knows who I am, was gone. And I didn't know what to do with it. Even when it came back, I still at times would think, I know what it's like to lose what your father believes in you. I know what it's like to lose when your father doesn't know who you are. I know what it's like to be left alone. He left. He didn't even know he left, but he left. I had to walk through that. When I was in fourth grade, I had a teacher look at me in my face in front of my fourth grade class and go, Vince Daniel, are you stupid? And I'm walking through that and I'm trying to transform my mind, but I have to read constantly. Why? So nobody thinks I'm stupid. I don't want them to think I'm ignorant. I don't think that I didn't, I didn't, I don't have a seminary degree. I don't have all this stuff. And I walk through this stuff and I, and I would put this weight on myself to be something because I need people to think this about me. Why? Because some lady, when I was 10 years old, said something to me. wasn't until I came face to face with a God who said, Vince, I know you struggle with this about your dad, but I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you hanging. I will not leave you alone. I will walk beside you in the fire. I will climb the mountain with you. I will be in the valley of the shadow of death with you. I will not go anywhere. But God, maybe you're going to be with me, but it doesn't change my mind. It doesn't change that I feel, no, Vince, you didn't read enough. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And everything that you need, I put in you. I put it in you to succeed in my will for your life, if you'll trust me. But until we start peeling it back and allow God to change the broken stuff in our minds, 
the things we've always believed that we don't know why we believe and we haven't asked God about it because we're prideful. We're prideful. We'll keep going because Paul talks about this a lot. You will then be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Some of you right now, as far, you're as far as you can go in this journey because you will not let God change your mind. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, that's pride, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each one of you. We so often will allow God to renew our spirit, but we fail to allow him to renew our mind. Colossians says this, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart, it feels so good to be in the presence of the Lord today. Set your heart on things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, verse two. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. We keep trying to pull our heart to heaven and our mind to the circumstances around us. We're never gonna grow. Paul closes with this and I'm gonna close. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I say rejoice louder for the people in the back. Let your gentleness be evident to all men that the Lord is near. Do not be anxious. Anxiety comes from your mind about anything. Oh, Pastor Vince, you, I, you don't know what I got. I, I don't know what you all have. But I know anxiety isn't helping it. It's not changing it. And it's not healing it. Be anxious about nothing. But in every situation, by prayer, by petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind, your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Are we seeing the pattern here? Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Paul gives us a list. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think Think about those things. Think about those things. We so often miss. Some of you are saying, I can't wait to get to heaven because all this will be over. Your salvation was not only about your ticket to the pearly gates. The Bible tells us clearly, by his stripes, we are healed. Healed. Here, on this earth, by his stripes, this dysfunction in your life can be healed. This broken pieces in your mind can be healed. Pastor Vince, I was abused and it was horrible. I know, and I'm so sorry. But can we go back to the process of what you're doing with that and make sure that the output is something healthy? Can we make sure that the output is something that gives glory to God and not a grip for the, for the enemy? Can we do that? Can we walk through that? That's where I want you to walk because then you live in the fullness of Christ. The fullness of who Jesus is. I know it's heavy and I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. It's why. It's why we're doing this series. I want you to live the good life. 